Okay. Uh, hi, thanks for the introduction. I'm, uh, I'm Daniel Genkin, and this is Rui Schuster. And the title of our talk is Physical Side Channel Attacks on PCs. Okay, and this will basically describe our journey at hacking laptop computers as opposed to embedded uh, devices. So when it comes to doing side channels on PC computers, there are broadly two types of categories, right? One is software side channels, where we have some microarchitectural resource, for example, this blue gear inside this processor, and an attacker and victim causing contention on this microarchitectural shared resource, and therefore an attacker can deduce something that the victim is doing. And microarchitecture and, and shared resources often cause microarchitectural side channels, but it's more than just the processor components, it's also timing channels over the network. Okay. Now, that's one category of side channels, and we usually call them software side channels. Why? Because you can exploit them through software. The other one is physical side channels. The things that this crowd likes more, which is like, you know, let's do power analysis on something. Let's glitch something. Let's, let's shoot EM into it or, or monitor EM from it. And what I'm going to show you today is that when it comes to laptop computers, at least, or desktops, there is another uh, channel, which is the acoustic channel, which is noise may em emitted by these devices. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to focus actually on the acoustic channel and show you that you can actually get information from the, uh, from the laptop devices using sound. And not only that, but then we'll top it by showing you a new category of attacks, which kind of straddles between these two. Okay, and I'm going to not spoil the surprise, and I'm going to let Roy talk about that. And before I get this chair out of the way, because otherwise it will get me, uh, let's start with acoustic emissions. So here's a, a relatively modern old computer, and this relatively modern old computer has still has some electromechanical components, okay? It has a CD-ROM drive, because we all love CD-ROM drives. It has a hard drive, which is, of course, a mechanical hard drive, so it needs to spin. Also has a fan, and when all these devices spin, they make friction, and therefore they make noise, okay? And honestly, I couldn't care less. This is not the noise we're looking for. On that motherboard, there are also capacitors and voltage regulators, which is the thing we're interested in, because these are part of the voltage regulatory uh, circuit on the motherboard, and, and it's trying to provide stable voltage under ever-changing current. Well, these devices physically move. And as they move, they create noise. Okay? So what do we need to measure that noise? Well... I have everything laid out in front of me, but this turned out to be a rat's nest of wires, so, and the, uh, the room is not staggered, so everything that is here, trust me, is also represented here in some shape or form. Okay, so we have a target laptop, we have a microphone, the microphone is in fact this silver thing at the end, the rest is just a handle. Where is my microphone? Here's my microphone, and the microphone is this silver thing at the tip, okay, the, re the, the rest is just a handle for me to grab it easier. Okay, I need a microphone power supply because I have a good microphone that uh, that can go really high up in frequency and sensitivity. And then I need some sort of a digitizer, which is a fancy name for a sound card, and some rat's nest of wires to hook all this up. Okay, so that's what that's what I have here. Okay, so let's see if we can. What, what can we learn if if we were to try to do it on a, on on a computer? And may the demo gods be with me, because. <laughs> Because this is as flaky as it gets. In, in fact, let me try stabilizing the AV here. This works better. Okay, so this diagram is called a spectrogram or a waterfall display. Okay, it's a sequence of FFTs. The vertical axis is the time axis, as you've all picked out. The horizontal axis is the frequency axis. So if I whistle, you can see my whistle at one kilohertz. Okay, and the more yellow something is, the more there is, uh, the more there is a given signal at a given frequency at a given time. So intensity or strength is yellow. Okay, and now I'm going to take my trusty old uh, laptop here. This is a ThinkPad T23. For those of you that know what that is, okay, and I'm going to aim a microphone to it, and I'm going to ask this laptop to do some instructions for us. Okay, wrong software. Don't do that. Try that. Okay. And as soon as I did that, well, the screen changed. So first of all, you know I'm doing this live and not lying to you. But let me pause the recording for a minute. And we can see patterns here. Okay. So first of all, we have these streak lines, these zebra patterns that show up because they look like a crosswalk. 
Well, what this computer is actually doing right now, it's doing one second loop of halt operations. And between them, there is one second loop of memory operations and one second loop of multiplications. The halts are typically the noisy part. So as soon as we have something like this, this is usually a halt. Between halts, we have memory and multiplication. And we can distinguish them. Why? Because this line sometimes appears and sometimes doesn't. So we can tell when this poor machine is doing memory operations and when it's doing multiplications. Of course, we don't know which is which because we're not looking at the screen relative to the spectrogram, but the point is we can distinguish between the two. Okay. Now, not only can we distinguish between the two, this goes even deeper because we, if we take it into a more controlled environment with an even better microphone, we can distinguish between halts, multiplications, floating point multiplications, additions, memories, knobs, and the entire thing repeats. Now you're wondering where is this leaving? Well, Audible ends at about here. This is about 50 kilohertz. This is all the way to 280 kilohertz. Okay, that's a very good microphone. And again, these are one second intervals of the same opcode over and over again. Okay, so it's there. But, well, of course, the next question is, well, it can be there, that's, 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 that's nice and fine, right? But what do we do with it, okay? Well, I don't want that. I want to hack something, right? Let's get a key out of something. So being a cryptographer, the natural way for me to, to attack something is RSA encryption. So now I'm going to throw a bunch of math at you because I'm, like, good at this, okay? So what's RSA? I'm going to whip it out. Well, RSA has two random primes, P and Q. It's a public key crypto system. The key is P and Q and a private exponent D. The public key is N equals PQ and a public exponent E. Encryption is M to the E mod N. You get back the ciphertext C. And RSA decryption, which is the interesting part where the secret key happens, is C to the D mod N and you get back the message M. If you didn't get all this math, well, doesn't really matter. All you need to know is that we take something, raise it to the power of something else, mod N, and we want the keys that live in this. Okay, of course, nobody quite does it like that. Instead, what people do is that they do two exponentiations modulo P and Q instead of one exponentiation modulo N because P and Q are smaller numbers and you can use a math trick to speed everything up. Okay, but again, all you need to know that two operations, C to the D mod P, C to the D mod Q, and we want D, P, or Q. Okay, that's what we would really like. I'm seeing the pain and suffering on somebody's fa on some people's faces here because of the math. I am sorry. I am an academic. Math we like. <laughs> okay. So, well, what happens if we're trying to run uh, if we're trying to run RSA and as we're running RSA, we are monitoring the uh, sound emissions from uh, from our devices. Well, it, this projector is kind of crappy, so it ate it. But you kind of see here that there is a line that breaks in the middle and then continues in another frequency, okay? And this is the transition between P and Q, okay? And not only that, we have five keys here, five decryptions of the same message using different keys. Let me say that again, five decryptions uh, using the same message and different keys. So what we're seeing is that, well, first of all, we can see every key, but also every key kind of looks different because the distance here between these two lines is wider here, even wider here, and here the second one even went completely AWOL. Okay, so every key has its own signature. And not only that it has on its own spectral signature, we can try listening to it. The problem is that, well, audible range ends here, uh, we need a dog to do that, and in an absence of a dog, what we're gonna do instead is that we're gonna down mix all these signals down in frequency, Okay, a bit too much. Thank you, PowerPoint. Okay, but let's at least try playing it. And looks like it doesn't want to play either because it's detected the HDMI. All right, good start for demos. So you're not going to hear it, I'm sorry. But let's say that we want to extract the keys out of it. Okay, that's really the problem. And the problem is that we have a 50 kilohertz signal. That's what acoustics is. It's between 0 and 50 kilohertz. And I'm being generous here because audible range ends at around 16. And we still have a 2 gigahertz computer. Okay, so how do we bridge these two gaps? 
we, we are three orders of, or six orders of magnitude slower in our signals than a two gigahertz computer. So the trick is to do some cryptoanalysis, and the idea is what's called liquid self-amplification. We're gonna shoot bad inputs into the algorithm in a way that amplifies that algorithm's leakage to a point where can we can detect it even if we don't really have the means to see the signals we're trying to see. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so again, I'm an academic, and academics, well, what we like, we like boxes. We like boxes with round corners and obstructions, right? So, so here's my obstruction on things. I'm gonna call it the bit distinguishing oracle. Okay, what does this weird box does? Well, it takes in a ciphertext with a specific condition where it must end with ones, okay? Runs it to decryption, analyzes the signal, and spits out, if the ciphertext is larger than Q, we get a zero. If the ciphertext is smaller than Q, is get a one. And the purpose in these two slides, besides inducing pain and suffering on the non-academic audience, is first of all, I'm gonna show you that if I were to have this box, I'm able to extract the key. And second slide, I'm gonna build that box with you. Okay, so bear with me. So, first argument is that if I have this magical box, I can extract the key. This is a sufficient primitive. Why is that? Well, let's do a binary search on Q. Take Q, it's a random prime, the bits of which we do not know, except the top bit which is set to one. Why? They're chosen that way. Okay, take the bits that you know, copy them over, put zero in the bit you don't know, fill the remaining with ones, and set it to decryption. As we send it to decryption, well, let's say that this thing analyzed the signal and, and spat out a one. What does one mean? One means that C is smaller than Q. Okay, how can C be smaller than Q? Well, the only way that this C can be smaller than this Q, and this C is filled with ones here, it's as big as it can get. And if it's still too small, that means that this zero is actually a one. Okay, that's the only condition that that can happen. So we know that the key lives in that space. We learned a bit. Let's try this again. Copy the bits that you know, put zero in the place you don't know, Fill the remaining with one, send it, fire it over, run it again, and this time this thing sped out a zero. And what does this mean? Well, it means that if this is a zero, then C is smaller, then C is larger than Q. The only way for C to be larger than Q is that this C uh, is, to, uh, uh, even though it's full of ones, is still too, uh, a bit on the small side, right? So this bit in, uh, so, sorry. So the only way for C to be larger than Q is that this bit has to be one, okay? So, sorry, this bit has to be zero. And here we go, okay? And the main point here is that you can do this one bit at a time and you will get the entire key. So, that's our primitive. Next question is, how can we build one? Well, I must inflict some more pain and suffering because if we were to build this primitive, we need to do some cryptoanalysis and figure out why, uh, why would this ever work. Well, remember, we're trying to raise C to the D mod Q. That's the decryption procedure. And because these are big numbers, these are 2048 bit numbers, we cannot do it in hardware, instead we do it in software. Okay, so now there is, a, there is an exponentiation algorithm to compute C to the D mod Q. Well, the problem is that to do exponentiations, you need to do a whole pile of mathematical multiplications. So now we get really, really deep into how do you multiply two numbers on a computer? And there is, again, in software, because the numbers are large. And there is a way to do it. Uh, it's called Karatsu uh, Karatsuba multiplication after Alexei Alexeyevich Karatsuba. Boring as hell, okay? And if this wasn't boring enough, I'm not gonna inflict you with more boring details. Okay, all you need to know about that algorithm is that it is recursive. Okay, like any good recursion, it has a base case. And in that base case, well, how do you multiply two numbers, naive? Okay, well, take x and y, chop y into 32-bit words, and for every word of y, multiply it by O of x, sum it up just like a school multi book multiplication, and be happy about it. Okay, except some smart programmer uh, figured at some point that we can improve performance by figuring out some corner cases, and one of them is that if the current word is zero, there is no point in doing the multiplication. Okay, the output is gonna be zero anyway, who cares, right? Keep going. Well, this is my one and only warning to all of you. If you have something like this in your code for all of you that are writing security code, well, I'm coming after you. 
because I'm a cryptographer and trust me, I know how to play with math to hit this if. Okay? So just to set up some numbers, this uh, blue code is going to run seven times, the purple code is going to run nine times, and the yellow code runs 2048 times once for every bit of D. And if these numbers look scary, well, they add up pretty quickly. This if gets hit 129,000 times, okay, during the run of the algorithm, which means half a second of measurement of on that if. Okay, that's the amplification component. So now, again, being a bored academic that is good at math, my job is to craft suitable inputs that have the following property. If the bit I want to extract is 1, which I don't know ahead of time, but if it is 1, then all of this y would be full of zeros, and therefore uh, will always be taken. And if the bit is 0, then this y would be full of non-zeros, and therefore the, the if would be almost never taken. I can craft you an, uh, an input C, a ciphertext C, that looks just like that, because I'm good at math. Okay? And once I feed this ciphertext into this entire shebang, guess what? I will be getting my favorite blue box out there, and this is why this needs to end with once. Okay? And now, just to show you that this actually works, okay, and not a theoretical threat, let's try doing this live. And again, may the demo gods be with me, you're going to see a series of lines. When these lines come close together, the bit is 0. When these lines go further apart, the bit is 1. Okay, and we're going to extract the, the, the key one bit at a time. Okay, still stable, still alive. That's, that's always good. So, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Anybody writing this down? There's going to be a pop <laughs> quiz at the end. There's a pop quiz at the end of this. OK? Your next coffee is contingent on recovering the key. OK? But we can clearly see the key coming out. OK? Everybody seeing that? Now, there is a run, another way to run these attacks. And if you think that sticking microphones new computers is not ridiculous enough, for the next trick, I need a volunteer from the audience. Anybody willing to give up their body for science? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good. This won't hurt much. <laughs> okay. No, no. Go there. Okay. So, I need you to hold this cable with one hand while, while touching this laptop on the, with your other hand. No, no. Grab it. Come on. Good. And now, what's your name? Ken. And now we have Ken sacrificing... Grab the thing! Okay, Just hold it. <laughs> and now we have Ken sacrificing his body through science, acting as an antenna, and we can get the key through Ken. Okay? Why? Because you're a good conductor, and you see the signal is there. It's actually quite clear. And while Ken is being slowly electrocuted here, okay, this actually does work. All right. So when putting microphones near computers is not good enough, just reach out and touch somebody. I heard that this is now appropriate because we are no longer so social distancing. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> Hope it didn't hurt. <laughs> so this is how you have fun with other people's laptops. You can do it from one meter away using a, a regular microphone. Or you can do it from 10 meters away using a parabolic reflector if you stick your microphone inside a parabolic reflector. I highly recommend you do that. Uh, it works, works actually pretty nice, but if you try traveling with something like that to an airport, well, guess what? You're going to meet some friends. Uh, okay? And after doing that a few times, there is also a mobile app version of this with just a commodity lab, a crappy phone microphone that can get it from 30 meters, uh, 30 centimeters away and no friendly pat downs <laughs> by these people. Okay? Or you can just reach out and touch somebody and, and, and make a world a better place. All right. So that's what I have. Now I'm going to transfer over to Rui, who's going to show you how to do all these attacks across the internet in a, in a socially distant, appropriate environment. Okay? So that's yours. You also need to hold that. Yeah. Okay. This working? Good. Um, great. So, physical side channels, as uh, uh, Daniel uh, was talking about, 
are really great because they don't need you don't need to execute any code on the target. All you need to do is measure it from a distance or even you know touch the machine, and uh, and then you extract traces and extract keys, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, well, they do require you to actually be somewhat close to the target. Even if you have this parabolic, this fancy parabolic dish, you still have to be like twenty meters away which is a major limitation uh, as we have perceived physical side channels so far. Um, and this, this work that we're uh, presenting now is going to challenge that assumption. Uh, and basically, we're going to show you today physical side channels that can be conducted completely remotely from across the ocean or across the world or whatever you want. How are we going to do that? So we can leverage the fact that um, modern laptops come with this uh, very, very familiar microphone. Uh, well, familiar to all of you, I hope, uh, by now. And uh, this microphone is uh, under the hood connected to a sound card. And uh, the it's connected to a sound card over a motherboard that uh, also contains the CPU. Uh, and this picture, this cartoon, is kind of reminiscent of uh, one of the setups that Daniel had a picture of in one of the first slides. And that's not a coincidence, uh, because actually this microphone can be used as a great EM probe. And it can, uh, uh, well, we hope, we'll see, but we hope that it can also measure um, uh, emanations from your CPU. Um, and basically, whatever, whenever the sound card is on, then maybe you are recording um, your CPU's operation, as well as whatever audio you're actually, like your speech or whatever. Um, Yes. Uh, and uh, more than that, uh, we've all become pretty acquainted with uh, uh, voice over IP applications where we're conversing with our colleagues and friends. And whenever we're doing that, then we're trans voluntarily transmitting this audio, uh, this signal picked up by the sound card that might contain uh, leakage from CPUs uh, to the whatever remote parties we're, we're online with. Uh, right. And, uh, okay, now I'm going to show you a quick demo. Uh, Daniel, where's the... The KVM thing? Oh, okay. Okay, so this is going to be very similar to uh, the uh, uh, spectrogram that Daniel showed you, except the one difference is that these two computers, this one and this one, are just uh, connected over a voice over IP software called Mumble. And uh, I'm gonna. I'm running on this machine. I'm running the the program that does some um, uh, cycles of uh, C have CPU heavy activity, then memory heavy activity, then sleeping. And you can see these cycles in the in the spectrogram uh, signal picked up on the other end of the uh, voice over IP call. Um, and I'm gonna go back. So that was this demo. Now uh, we, we experimented on various machines. Uh, this happens uh, all across any laptop we've ever uh, tried to to measure, um, and uh, and uh, we, we saw that this uh, leakage uh, from the CPU of the remote computer over a voice over IP call happens across any common voice over IP software you're going to use. So the uh, codecs that are usually lossy that these softwares employ don't em eliminate this leakage, uh, fortunately for us. Uh, and now we're going to use this to actually do something. We're going to use this to actually identify a website. Uh, but for that, I will need a second to start another demo. And this is the last demo for today, so hopefully it works. Um, okay, I started it. It's gonna take a few seconds to run. While it's running, I'm gonna explain what's happening. So um, this computer is going to visit a couple of websites, Google and YouTube, uh, while it is, again, on a voice over IP call with this computer. Um, and uh, this, this attacker computer is going to measure it. Uh, so this is what's happening. Uh, and then in our paper, we show that the attacker can use like fancy neural networks to infer which uh, which um, 
website the victim computer is visiting. But here we're only going to visit two websites and we're going to show the, the, some visual differences between them uh, that, are, uh, that are just, you, you can just see them on the uh, attacker's computer. Um, again, using convolutional neural networks, we were able to achieve 94% uh, accuracy for 14-way classification. There is some deeper characterization of this number in our paper, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty nice. Uh, and this is still not done, I think. Okay, right in time. So these are the signals. You can see that there are differences. Uh, what you can't see here is that, well, they were treated the same way, but they look different. Uh, what, you, uh, what you can't see here is that if I did this multiple times, then the, this, the trace that was recorded while the victim was visiting Google is going to be similar to across multiple runs, uh, whereas it's going to be different from the trace that is recorded while the victim is visiting YouTube. So that is what we can use to distinguish between the two. And uh, sometimes it won't be visually different, but the neural network can also can can overcome that, or it can detect differences that we can't with our eyes. Um, and now I'm going to talk about key extraction because that is even uh, even more dangerous, right? So uh, here again we have the same setup where there is a victim and there is an attacker. The victim is talking to an attacker over some voice over IP software. Um, and the attacker is going to use some fancy machinery, and the, the victim is also signing, uh, uh, signing cryptographically signing messages while they are um, on a chat with the attacker. And the, the attacker is going to use some fancy machinery to extract the key. Uh, here we're going to extract the ECDSA key. ECDSA has a key generation, signing operation, and verification. And uh, the signing has this uh, interesting part where there is a scalar by point multiplication. Um, where the scalar is a random nonce that's supposed to be secret. It's supposed to be kept secret. So since it's supposed to be kept secret, it has a constant time um, impl the implementation. However, um, as the I think the Minerva people uh, um, uh, exposed uh, in 2020, um, this constant time implementation actually has a bug. What does this bug do? Uh, internally, the it's just... Uh, the multiplication is implemented with some sort of loop, and the loop skips any leading zeros in the random nonce. Since there is a, since it skips leading zeros, we have a linear correspondence between the number of leading zeros and the time that the algorithm takes to run, um, because every other iteration is, of course, constant time. Um, and now we're going to do some signal processing. Um, so uh, the, our attacker can extract the trace, uh, um, transform it to the time domain, then uh, run a bandpass in AMD modulation, and then we get this valley in the signal where um, where the duration of the valley corresponds roughly and noisily, <laughs> very noisily, to uh, the time that it takes to sign, to uh, sorry, to the time that it takes to do the multiplication. And now, uh, how can we use this? So, um, we are going to use uh, RFC 6979 version of ECDSA where um, where nonces are derived deterministically from a key and a message. And uh, this is going to allow us to, basically if we group traces by message and then uh, we can uh, run the same, sign the same message multiple times, um, we will get the same nonce. And we will be able to average out the noise and reject some outliers and get pretty good uh, indication of whether or not of the number of leading zeros in the nonce that corresponds to this message. Uh, and then what we're really looking for here is we're looking to get enough, uh, enough messages, signed messages, with, uh, that we know that have sufficiently um, few, su sorry, sufficiently many leading zeros. Once we have that, we have enough uh, nonces or enough side messages with nonces that we have enough bits that we know. Uh, and that is sufficient to run the lattice attack, which is the fancy machinery I'm not going to talk about of Albrecht and Henninger. Um, and we were able to extract the key from traces of 20,000 signed messages, each repeated 91 times. So 
Um, the key extraction itself takes about 20 minutes, but of course, signing this, these messages and recording them takes uh, longer than that. Um, and now, the, for the last thing, I'm going to show you uh, our killer app, so to speak. Um, it's so it's an attack on Counter Strike, uh, which uh, is a game which arguably uh, people are very motivated to to cheat in because uh, it's it could be considered a textbook example of an esport. Uh, where it's played in, played in orchestrated leagues and there's like large prizes and uh, people some people take it take Counter Strike very very seriously, um, and uh, uh, in Counter Strike again we have the setup where we have a victim and they're on a voiceover IP call with the attacker, uh, they're playing against each other and this is actually reasonable if you're playing a one on one game that you would have a, a, a chat with your with your opponent. Um, and uh, what's happening in Counter Strike is that it's a sort of a game. This this, this is a little too dark, but uh, for this projector. But um, there, are, this is a truck, and this is like an attacker and a victim. And so it's a game where there is m multiple objects and things you can hide behind. And the, the it's a first person shooter game where the goal is to find and kill your opponent. Um, so our attacker will want to know where the opponent is, and how can they do that? Uh, well, apparently, uh, the, for because of the way Counter Strike is implemented, uh, whenever the attacker is close to the victim, for a, some definition of the word "close," um, the victim's machine is actually rendering the attacker's avatar, uh, and the attacker can pick up on that because they are on a voiceover IP call with them, and there is this leakage from the CPU. So. Uh, what the attacker is going to do is there, we're going to see it in this, not demo, but video. So if the attacker is in this sort of a truck, and whenever they're going to move from right to left inside the truck, whenever they're moving right, they see this zebra pattern uh, on the on in their signal, which corresponds to the victim rendering the, the attacker's avatar. So by just moving closer to the victim, the attacker can see where the victim is, and uh, it, even though the victim is hiding, the attacker now knows that the victim is on the right-hand side of the truck, and they're going to exit the truck and flank them and uh, destroy them. And, uh, yeah, with this, uh, we're going to conclude our talk. Uh, and I highly encourage you to check out our paper, and we'll take questions now. Questions? Okay. Okay, we'll come. Uh, so, first off, this is insanely cool. I, I can't even express how cool this is. But as we look at, you know, modern computing and where we're going in the future, I mean, noise is just part of daily life. I mean, how, how would somebody defend or, or a manufacturer defend against this type of attack? So depends on on, on on threat modeling, right? If if uh, if the threat model is over uh, over the internet through internal coupling, then god damn it, isolate your analog sensors from the processor, right? Common mode rejection is a thing. Test for it. Okay. If the threat is from the outside, well, guards and windows and and and, and bark dogs and and everything you need to get to to put range be, 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 between you and the and, and, and your attacker. But although these two sound natural, like it's not, it, it, I would argue it's not the way to go. The way to go is make sure that your instructions are constant time, constant EM, constant cache, constant everything, highly regular. And it's, it's very hard to do, but as side channels on computing become slowly a thing and a tool, then we need to start fighting back. And we already have some constant time foundations. We have... EM masking, we have tools in the embedded industry to fight this. None of them is applied. It's, it, there are no countermeasures to these things right now. And that, that would I, where I would start. Yep. Thank you. Did you look into, um, I guess, sample devices with different clock speeds or even other architectures to see if there's a significant you know, variation? Uh, well, we had that slide where we showed that that uh, various laptops leak, uh, right? Um, but like, if outside. you're trying to extract a key and you had you know two laptops running at you know 
pretty different clock speeds. Do you have to account for that in your software? Yes, yes. yes. You you would have to. Well, the setup is is specific for the laptop that we extracted the key from. Um, we show that, for example, uh, if you want to, well, we have. This is this is this is a uh, this comes up every time we do a side channel, like because it's always specific to the machine. And then, but we do uh, have ample work showing that you can actually learn from many machines and then generalize to other machines you haven't seen. Okay. So, it's, but it's expensive to do that because you actually need to experiment with a bunch of machines, a bunch of like clock um, uh, speeds, etc. And have you tried on ARM? We have not tried on. Uh, I have it, So depends what again, right? A these so these specific two attacks works well, work well on high energy devices. Okay, like think about this hundred watt CPU that that, that 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 has a lot of power and therefore fluctuates everything. Okay, ARM is not like that. At least not probably the ARM you're thinking. I, I don't think you're talking about the server ARM. You're talking about the phone ARM, right? It's designed not to be like that. Okay, so those are not a good examples. But EM on ARM, good old EM works beautifully because it's also less shielded. So the trade-off is a bit different. Okay. Now, to emphasize on Roy's point on generalization, the signals, here's a random selection of crap we had lying around, okay, and they all look the same. It's up to scratching operations like this and like that, and writing algorithms that are general enough to deal with any sort of stretching, but that's where the challenge is. But that's also where the challenge stops. It's all there just for the picking. Right, thank you. Uh, I think uh, my question is very close to the last one. Uh, I don't know if you tried several PCs to, to find if they are leaking in the same way or not. Here they are. <laughs> six, PCs, six random selections of PCs. Um. Sorry? Uh, no, there is no Apple here. We, 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 li we like Lenovo. Leno <laughs> this, this, this question always come up, comes up. We should have a slide yeah. with Apple. We should have a slide with Apple, yeah. yes. We should, we should run it on an Apple and see what happens. Um, so does this attack work in environments where, like, let's say you have a, a processor running multiple different processes on different threads? How would you distinguish instructions if there's several so, different processes running instructions? So everything you saw here today... These computers run Linux, okay? Some of them run all the networking stack because some of the demos run over the internet, right? There is hundreds of processors running, processes running here just because I said Linux, right? And yet it still works. Once you do leak itself amplification, it's there. It's there and it's more powerful than anything, uh, than, than anything you have lying around which is not amplified. The algorithmic way of amplifying something by sending it inputs that trigger evil things wins over any other system noise and measurement noise that you might have. Okay, so we what's should... happening is basically you're triggering the operations using your, your input, and that creates a sufficient yes. amount of... Yes, and that's how you win the game. Okay. And that's how you win the game. We should also say that the, the website attack, for example, we intentionally mounted it while running a bunch of other processes that are like uh, CPU hungry in the background to see that there are still noticeable differences between different websites. Um. Okay, any other questions? All right, just one more question we can take then. Thanks, so the, the, first, uh, the first attack you show is it shows in ciphertext attack. Yes. All right. Most people don't run HSMs on their laptop. What, what would be a use case of where you could use a chosen ciphertext attack against a laptop? So the, 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 there are a bunch, and my favorite one used to be encrypted email, right? Because I'm going to send you emails of cats with pixels arranged so that they're mod, so that they're a negative one modulo p, and when you interpret them as bits, and therefore you will decrypt my cat picture, and okay. And I'll, I'll get you key. That's just one exa example. There are a bunch of signing operations done throughout protocols, which, which would be the, my, my favorite other example. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, for our friend who gave his body for science, we have a giveaway okay. for you to give. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yes. you should come. Uh, thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again for volunteering. <laughs>